<laughs> you may be counting. Now, now we're streaming live on Facebook. Okay. Uh, Jim, I am not hearing you. I hope everyone else is, however. I actually muted it because I thought we'd turn it over to you, but um, I'm not sure it seemed to be glitching on my end for broadcasting it to live. So I'm going to quick repeat the intro for those of you who may have already heard it. I apologize, but we'll do it again just in case. Yeah. Well, um, then, will being, you be muted while I'm talking? I am going to mute it while you're doing the reading, just for the reading so that if there's, oh, I don't know, kids or dogs running around in the background, you're not going to hear. <laughs> As happens these days. Um, I apologize for any technical glitches. If you've already seen this intro, I apologize, but it seems to have been glitching a little bit. I'm going to quick intro again. Um, this is the Bain Live reading. Uh, we've got Lois Master Bujol tonight. We're going to start with her reading from her newest work, Penrick's Travels. On the Facebook comment section, give me your questions, even while she's doing the reading, if it's about Penrick, if it's about Miles, it's about her other fantasy works, if it's about how she's getting by in the quarantine or what's going to be happening this weekend at the Nebulas where she's receiving the Grand Master, feel free to put those questions into the comments section. And three lucky people whose questions that I will then read to Lois and she'll answer live on the broadcast will receive a free ebook of Penrick's Travels. And without further ado, the multiple Hugo Award winning, multiple Nebula Award winning, uh, legend of science fiction and fantasy and very soon to be crowned grandmaster <laughs> master Bujol. they don't actually give you a crown but uh, but it sure feels like it good evening um, i'm going to be reading tonight from penrick's travels which is the bain reprint edition of the second three novellas in the penrick and desdemona series uh, most of you out there probably already know what this is, but it is a, uh, a story about a, in the beginning, young sorcerer in the world that I first developed in uh, The Curse of Chalion and then continued to develop in, in Paladin of Souls and The Hallowed Hunt. Um, and so this was, this was my chance to revisit that world. Uh, and it's, it's been a lot of fun, and it's also been a kind of semi-retirement experiment in that I have been publishing them uh, originally as uh, indie e-novellas. I wanted to get into that and, and sample the waters and that, that has worked out well. So I've been in writing them a la carte and putting them up as I finish them. And uh, uh, they've been picked up by Subterranean for lovely little hardcover um, reprints and also Blackstone audio books made an audio edition. So they've just, marched on and on without my having to do anything. It's been wonderful. Uh, so tonight I'm going to read from the opening of Penrick's Travels, uh, which is a collection of the second three novellas, which are Penrick's Mission, Mira's Last Dance, and The Prisoner of Limnos, which are three very closely connected in terms of time and uh, succession of events. Uh, more so than the first three uh, novellas that was in uh, Penrick's, uh, uh, Penrick's Progress, the first collection. Oh, I should have one of those to hold up. Too late. Um, but uh, I think you could just jump in here. You know, if this is the first Penrick you pick up, I think you'll be just fine. The, the story will explain itself as it goes. Uh, and uh, if you want to start at Penrick's beginning, you can drop back to Penrick's Progress. So I will actually be reading from my tablet because the print is bigger. <laughs> Let's see how this goes. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the opening of Henrik's Mission, uh, which is the first novella in the three novella collection. Desdemona, Henrik breathed, awed. Will you look at that light? He leaned on the railing of the Adriac cargo ship, coasting slowly up the narrowing Gulf of Patos and stared eyes wide at the rocky shores of Sidonia. The dry clarity of the air made the distant granite mountains seem as sharp cut as glassmaker's crystal. The angled sun of the morning was the color of honey. He tilted back his head to take in the astonishing blue vault above, so deep it was dizzying. He felt he might dive up through it as into the sea, endlessly, and never drown. It was what he imagined enchantment should be in some myth or legend of personified elements. 
the man who fell in love with the sky. Mortals, he was reminded, did not usually come out well at the ends of those tales. Yes, but by noon it will scorch that pale scholar's skin of yours to blisters. Keep yourself covered. I'll have to see about getting you a proper hat, his demon returned, speaking through his mouth as prosaically as the bossy older sister he sometimes imagined her to be. But he thought she was not unmoved by the sight, shared through his eyes, of the light of the land of, could you call it her birth? That she'd last departed, what, over a hundred years ago? Longer than that, she sighed. He pressed his finger to his lips, warning her not to speak aloud in company, and moved around to the prow, keeping clear of the crewmen shifting ropes and sails. Half a dozen other passengers clustered there to catch a first glimpse of the city that lent the gulf its name. The ship came about and tacked toward the farther shore, climbing a slight headwind. A tumbled slope drew aside like a stage curtain, revealing their goal. Spread across the wide amphitheater of the gulf's head, Patos seemed built of the bones of this land. Stone houses with red tile roofs, stone streets arched and colonnaded, the familiar five-fold shape high on one hill of a stone temple. A broad stone fortress guarded stone keys reaching out into the clear blue waters where a dozen other cargo ships crowded offloading. The grove of cranes and masts made up for what seemed to Penrick's eyes a decided lack of trees, which was in part why his ship's heavy lading of cut timber was expected to be welcome trade. A bit slow, bulky, boring, a ship for ordinary men with ordinary purses to make passage in, such as a lawyer's young clerk carrying a sheaf of unsigned merchant's agreements and a hopeful marriage contract, all entirely bogus. He adjusted the strap on his shoulder and touched the leather case that held them, plus the second set of documents that was much less dull, sewn covertly inside its lining. Velka gave a little wave as Penn joined him on the forward deck. The man was a Sidonian mercantile agent with whom Penrick had made friends, or at least friendly acquaintance, on what he had been assured was a remarkably smooth three-day sail from the Adriatic city of Lodi, and on whom he'd been happy to practice his Sidonian. Smiling slightly, Velka said, still excited for your first trip to Sidonia? Yes, Ben admitted, grinning back, still inebriated by the morning light and not even bothering to be sheepish. The young clerk should certainly be allowed such elation. I expect you will find it full of surprises. I expect so too. Des passed to no comment, even internally, but Penn felt she watched the harbor scene as keenly as he did. Two oarsmen in Sidonian Customs Tabard rowed a green painted boat out from the quay and swung alongside Penn's ship. He picked up his single valise and followed Velka with the first batch of passengers to disembark, making his way over the side and down the rope net without mishap. When it had rid itself of its human freight, the ship would go on to another quay at the Imperial Naval Shipyard and Arsenal to discharge, discharge its timber. Tem, Penrick mused on the rationale, which rather escaped him, of one country as selling essentials for shipbuilding to another country when they might, some future year, be at war or at least in chronic naval clashes with each other. Well, the puzzle did not fall within the ambit of this fishing. Imperial customs consisted of a long wooden shed housing tables, a few agents in official tunics, some bored guards, and a dull air of bureaucracy. The passengers shuffled into line and turned out their goods for inspection. His clerk, when Penn took his turn, examined his fake papers and wrote down his fake name and age and fake business with only mild interest. His valise was dumped out on the table and his possessions pawed through as the clerk looked for Penn knew not what. His belongings had been carefully selected back in Adria to fit his travel persona and included nothing of interest. Most certainly not his white robes of a divine of the bastard's order or the white cream and silver shoulder braids marking him as a temple sorcerer, nor even the four colored green braids of a teaching physician of the mother's order, which had been hoisted on him back home in Martinsbridge, even though he had declined to take oath to a second god. The faint ink stains on his long fingers might well have belonged to a lawyer's clerk. In any case, his most secret and dangerous contraband, 
his chaos demon who gave him his uncanny powers passed entirely unsuspected. Velka, lingering to speak with some port official, waved Penrick on and Pen emerged once more into a light grown even sharper. He stepped away briskly, not wanting to be lumbered with a companion at this stage. He wondered if he should first seek out the man he'd come all this way to bargain with or go find lodgings. Perhaps locate the fellow, then pick lodgings convenient to him. Asking around the harbor marketplace for his quarry's address would leave a trail of witnesses to his interest. There must be something more discreet. Good thinking, observed Desdemona. Your best bets will be up by the provincial governor's palace or some tavern near the army barracks where the soldiers gather. It felt strange to have a visceral sense of the layout of a city he'd never set foot in before, but one of Desdemona's previous writers had lived here for some years. Over a century ago, Penn reminded himself. <clears throat> Things would have changed, although probably not major buildings or streets, not with all this stone. The marketplace, a semi-permanent little village of booths and awnings, smelled of fish, ropes, tar, and spices. Offerings included used clothing, domestic tin work and ceramics and food, exotic to pen, oranges and lemons, dried figs and nuts and strange bright vegetables, olives and their oils. The vendors and patrons showed nearly as much variety. Men and women and children of both sexes running about adding their notes of chaos. Clothing tended to loose linens, tunics and trousers for the men, demure draperies for the women. Skin colors ranged from almost Ragnari bronze to olive to a deep brick tan on those who clearly worked outdoors. Hair was as varied, curly to straight, sun-streaked bronze, dark copper, browns, brown, but mostly black. He was glad he'd taken the advice to dye his own to an unassuming brown for the journey. His blonde white hair stood out even back home. Here, where he found his mountain average height suddenly, half a head taller than most men around him, it would have blazed in the sun like a signal beacon. His eyes he could do nothing about, save to squint a trifle. He attempted to shrink in a clerk's stoop. Completing his fascinated survey of the market, he began a stroll up a street leading toward the hill hosting the governor's palace. The noise of the harbor, seabirds crying, workmen and vendors shouting, the creak of cranes, clack of hooves and rumbling of carts, at first eclipsed the steady double time of booted feet coming up behind him. When he turned, a squad of half a dozen soldiers was almost in his face. Halt you, cried their sergeant. Henrik tensed on his toes, but obeyed, blinking and smiling, free hand out empty and unthreatening. Hello, he tried in a friendly tone. Can I help you? Only then to see, did he see Velka running behind them, pointing at him. That's the spy, arrest him. His first impulse to try to talk himself out of this contretemps died as he reflected that a more thorough search of his leather document case must surely find its hidden compartment and the Duke's secret letters, and then no amount of talking would help. But his well-filled purse was hung hidden on a cord around his neck his case strap slung over his opposite shoulder, unsnatchable. As the sergeant pulled his short sword from his sheath and swung it upward, Des thought, Penn thought, Des, speed us. From his point of view, his would-be assailant slowed. Penn flung his valise at the sergeant, knocking him backward, and ducked another man's leisurely sword thrust. His own movements always felt as though he were fighting through oil when he did this, but he drove force through his legs and turned, taking the first few steps of a sprint away, where he would have to work out later. But now he bounded directly into the other half of the squad who turned onto the street just above him, bearing down upon him with raised truncheons. He evaded four languid blows as sinuously as any striking snake. Jerking successfully away from a fifth swing, smashed the side of his head into a sixth with a lot more power than even the man who wielded it had probably intended. The world turned to stars and snow as he gasped and dropped, cracking his head on the stones again as his flailing hands missed catching himself. Nauseating black clouds bloomed in his vision as he did not quite pass out. 
Passing out would have allowed him to evade the pain and misery that followed. Plenty of strong hands combined to hoist his long body up and hurry him back down the hill and through the gates of the shore fortress. Shadows flickered overhead, then stone. At first he thought he was swooning for certain as the world darkened, despite the continued drumming in his skull, but they were just going underground. An orange blur of torchlight wavered past him. The passage narrowed, widened, narrowed again, widened again. He was held down and efficiently stripped of case, boots, purse, belt, and belt knife, and his outer garments. Someone grabbed him by the hair and growled, what is your real name? Penn couldn't even groan in reply, though he panted and then suddenly vomited on his interrogator. As defenses or even revenges went, it seemed weak, but at least the man leapt back, swearing. Bosco, you hit him too cursed hard. You can't talk in that state. Sorry, Sergeant, but it was his fault. He ducked into me. Never mind, said Velka's voice. I dare say this will answer all the questions anyone has. Velka, yes, seemed to have taken loving possession of the leather case. A smile of satisfaction curled his lips. Ted grew sorry he hadn't let Des cheat the man at dice after all, shipboard. I don't suppose he can climb down the ladder on his own now, said a soldier. We could just drop him in. Ah, if you want to break both his legs. So is he going to be needed for anything later, aside from his execution, asked the sergeant of Pengast Velka. Too soon to know. Best preserve him for the moment. A brief professional bait among the soldiery resulted in Penn, dressed only in his shirt and trousers, being lowered into the darkness by a rope wound painfully under his arms, shepherded by a soldier on a twisting rope ladder. His bare feet, then knees, then the rest of him found cold, raw rock as he collapsed. Rope, soldier, and ladder all disappeared upward. The scrape of a heavy stone overhead cut off both the voices and the last faint reflections of the torch. Utter silence, utter darkness, utter aloneness, only not for him. Death, he groaned, are you still with me? A shaken pause. They'd have to have spattered your brains all over the street for me to be anywhere else. Despite his current throbbing pain, his curiosity prompted him to ask, where would you have jumped? A sense of surly thought. Valka, all else being equal, a demon forced to jump by the death of its rider usually went to the strongest other person in the vicinity. Really? He would not have lived long. A pause and he would have died in all the lingering agony I could arrange. Penn wondered if that was how a chaos demon said, I love you. More or less, said Des in their silent speech as his lips grew harder to move. Penn, pay attention. You mustn't swoon. Your skull is cracked and you're bleeding inside it. We can burn close the whole, burn close the blood vessel, but we have to open a hole to let out the clot before the pressure kills you. You want me to trepan myself? I'll do it, but you have to stay conscious. I can't work it if you, if you understood. Destructive medicine. Sometimes it saved lives. Sometimes it didn't. His head was in so much pain already, exploding open a hole the size of his fingertip hardly made a difference. The spurt of blood seemed small, but a little of the numbness left his lips. Yes, that's right, and he wasn't sure which of them said it. Can I pass out now? Hurts. No, stay awake. We have to finish shifting the clot. That too was right, familiar, and a very unpleasant prospect. Was Des in as much pain as he was? Maybe not, but if his mind and body broke down, she would fragment too. Can't be fun for you either. No. After a little, he asked, Des, can you light my eyes? Yes. In a moment, the blackness pulled back. With no light at all to work with, the effect was peculiar, oddly colorless, but his sense of the space and the shapes around him grew secure. They seemed to be in a round chamber quarried out of the bedrock, about 14 feet high and seven wide, its chiseled walls curving steadily inward to the small port at the top, presently blocked by the heavy stone. Henrik studied the cruel angles and 
meditate on the, meditated on the mountain climbing experiences of his youth. No, I don't think even I could scale this one, and certainly not in this condition. In his imagination on the trip over, he'd confidently posited that no locked door could hold them. Is this place meant to be proof against sorcerers? Had Belka penetrated that secret as well as his others? It's a standard Sidonian bottle dungeon, a place they put prisoners they don't want to forget, it said. Ever been in one before? And unsaid, ever got out of one before? Except the hard way, he supposed, minus her rider. And now, in a little while, he crawled to the wall and clawed up far enough to turn and brace his shoulders against it. They paused to tease out the last of the clot, and he felt gingerly at the spreading wetness behind his ear, soaking his walnut-dyed cue. It wasn't going to add up to enough blood loss to kill him, at least not on this side of his skull. He sat up and concentrated on keeping breathing. As ambitions went, it seemed much reduced from this morning, but it was challenge enough for now. Okay, and then I'm going to skip forward a couple of scenes to the second viewpoint character of this novella. Uh, and we will introduce Nikki's to you and the world. Two. The shadows in the municipal magistrate's court and prison at midnight make Nikki's want to crawl inside her own skin. She drew her dark green cloak closer about her and padded as silently as she could after the jailer she'd bribed to let her in to see her brother. This jailer would do more, or rather see even less, if she could bring her plan about. He led her up stone stairs and out onto the third floor gallery overlooking the courtyard. In the night silence, the boards creaking under their feet seemed screams, not mouse squeaks. No dank dungeon cells with iron bars on this level, just a row of small rooms that could as well have been civic offices, apart from their heavy locked doors with narrow iron bound slots. Nikki's tried to extract the political meaning from this choice of confinement, more austere than house arrest, not so vile as, say, those oubliettes down at the old harbor fortress. Maybe it was mere prudence. If they'd attempted to arrest and hold the young general out at the army barracks or in the shore fortress, he'd likely have been smuggled aid before this. For all that he'd commanded in Patos for barely half a year, he was already starting to grow popular with his men, if only for his diligence in getting them paid on time. Although on the lately disputed southwestern borders, men had followed him for much less. Victory is the best pay an officer can give his men, Adelis had once remarked, and vice versa. A brilliant campaign of maneuver and strike, it was said, turning back the Russillan incursion with half forces, wits, and spit. Adelis himself had called it the bastard's own dysentery. In any just world, in any other country, his labor should have resulted in promotion and reward, not semi-exile to a minor provincial post and heightened political suspicion. Doubtless exacerbated by his mother's blood ties to the imperial house for all that several prior two successful army generals had ridden on the shoulders of their soldiers to Sidonian imperial power without such bonds. But if Adelis had such ambitions, she'd never seen a hint and she'd known him from the day of their births. The jailer peered through the door slot. He did not startle the knight by knocking, but just called softly, General Arasadia, you have a visitor. Handing Mickey's the shaded dark lantern, he unlocked the door and let her slip within, but stayed nervously on guard outside. Adelis, dressed only in a loose shirt and string-tied trousers, sat on his cot, blinking in the sudden spear of light. As Nikki set the lantern on the little table and swept back her hood, he swung out bare feet and bolted upright to embrace her, the power of his grip silent witness to his anxiety. She embraced him just as hard, then pushed away to search his face, hands, arms for signs of torture. Bruises, yes, but no worse than he might have picked up at sword practice. As his wits caught up with the rest of him, he shoved her back, 
though not loosening his drowning man's clutch on her shoulders. What are you doing here at this hour? He said through his teeth. Or at all, five gods, Nickies? I prayed you'd have the sense to stay clear of all this. All of this came to me. The day you were arrested, the governor sent men to search my house. They took all my letters from you and my old letters from Kaimus. What they could want with those. I was so furious. His jaw tightened. Did they hurt you? She shook her head. Just shoved me back when I protested. Despite it all, the corners of his lips twitched. Did you hurt them? God's witness, I tried, she said. They knocked down my servants, ransacked the house, tore up the floorboards and pried apart paneling and furniture, especially in your chamber, turned out all the clothes chests and left everything in piles. Although they were clearly after, well, I don't know what they were after, but they really didn't pillage us and no one was raped. A lot of small valuables turned up missing after they left, but you'd expect that. She drew breath. Adelis, where did all this come from? All I could find out is that you are accused of plotting treason with Adria, which is nonsense. He shook his head. I swear I don't know. They said they'd seized my correspondence with the Duke of Adria, detained his agent, but I'd never made any contacts with Adria. They didn't let me see the evidence. Said it had gone in a courier patch to Thassalon days before, and this arrest order was the result. Not that they need the authentic letters for that sort of move. Forgeries to entrap you, do you think? Maybe. She flung up a hand. Later, we can talk later. Dress, gather your things. I have to get you out of here, right now. What? Instead of obeying, he stepped back and stared. Nikki, is this some sort of harebrained rescue scheme? Yes, she snapped, declining to waste time arguing about the embedded insult. Hurry. Instead, he shook his head. Bad idea. Staying here is a worse one. I agree it's not good, but nothing would convict me in my accuser's eyes, in the emperor's eyes, faster than fleeing like a guilty thief. Do you imagine they haven't convicted you already? There's been no trial, no hearing. When did you grow so naive? He smiled sadly. If I didn't run from 4,000 screaming Rusillian tribesmen, I'm not going to run from this. They attacked from the front. This is an ambush from behind in the dark. Oh, the Rusilli did that too. She grimaced, fierce in her frustration. What in the world is your plan then? Stand my ground, argue my case, continue to speak the truth. And if that ground has already been cut from under you, I did not commit treason and I will not. I'm not without friends as well as enemies at court. Argue your case from a safer place. There isn't a safer place, not within the bounds of the empire, and to leave it would turn the false charges true. She leaned her forehead against his shoulder, so frenzied she nearly bit his shirt. Adelis, it has to be tonight. I can't do this again. I spent all I had on the bribes just to get this far and the horses. Suborned men don't give refunds. He sank down in his cot and did a good simulation of a boulder, stolid and immobile, stubborn. It ran in the family. If she'd brought four men, whacked him over the head and carried him out in a sack, she might have been able to do this. But when that look grew on his face, nothing less would shift him. She'd sometimes admired the trait, but not when it was aimed at her. You have to leave, he argued in turn, and stay well away. You're bound to be watched, but you're not enough of a threat to be any to anyone in your own right for them to go after you without provocation. For the love of all the gods and goddesses, for the love of me, don't give that provocation. You're saying I should do nothing, just freeze to the ground like a hare menaced by a hawk? That would be a good start, yes. He swiped his hands through his dark, disheveled hair clenched them on his knees. Please don't try to engage them with something so far over your head as this. The last thing I need is for my enemies to realize how effective a lever on me you could be. Tears were leaking down her cheeks and she hated their wet helplessness. Curse all men and their pride and their greed and their envy and their idiocy and their fear. 
He grinned at her, his rich brown eyes crinkling. Ah, that's my Mickey's. She couldn't scream here. She couldn't even yell. Another 10 minutes of ferocious undervoiced argument moved him no further. He should have been made a siege commander, she thought. Only the frightened jailer stopped it. He cracked the door and hissed, that's enough. Madame Katai, you must come away now. I can't stay out here any longer. Adelis, Adelis pushed, the jailer pulled, and she found herself once more on the gallery, bewildered in the dark. He led her back down the stairs, outside archway to the entry with the postern door, where they found a troop of six guardsmen and a senior captain waiting for them. The jailer had not revealed her. He whimpered too as they were roughly seized. Another lantern was unveiled and raised, pushing back the shadows. Where is he? asked one of the guardsmen, sounding confused. The captain stepped forward. Cornered, she yanked back her hood and raised her chin. Protests and subterfuge and lies jammed up in her mouth, choked by fear. Wait, give nothing away. Madame Katai, the captain grimaced. Imagine meeting you here at this hour. Oddly, his ironic tone steadied her. This was a man who would talk, not strike, or at least talk before he struck. If anyone here had possessed the common courtesy or holy mercy to let me see my own brother in the daytime, I would have. I took what I could get. His glance seared the shrinking jailer, so it seems. You mustn't blame him. I cried at him, you know, which was true, if incomplete. The captain, she suspected, was not a man whom feminine tears would soften. But let him think this was just an anxious visit from kin, not an escape attempt, and perhaps the poor man would get off more lightly. And where is your brother? Right where you people put it, unjustly. Her lips drew back in something that was hardly a smile. He claims the father of winter will support him in his innocence. The captain vented a faint snort, but stepped aside to murmur to two of his men who departed at a run. They returned in a few minutes to report, the general is still locked in, sir. The captain stared at her in some frustration. Had he hoped to catch her in the act? He said conversationally, we have your horses and your servant, you know. Rather a lot of baggage for an evening jaunt through town, don't you think? It wasn't as though she'd left them waiting at the prison's front gate. So she'd been spied upon, make that more effectively spied upon, than even she had suspected. Not that anyone who'd really known the general and his widowed sister could have been too surprised at this turn of events, but how many people in Patos was that really? She lived retired by choice and seldom taxed Adelis at camp. He in turn was respectful, respectful of her privacy. Betrayed from before the beginning, it seemed. Her dead silence was apparently not the reaction for which the captain had rehearsed. So he gave up trying to draw her out replacing his heavy irony with sternness. Your efforts on your brother's behalf are understandable, madam, but pointless. If you return here at midday tomorrow, the general will be given back to you freely without impediment. In fact, he narrowed his eyes at her. In fact, we will escort you home now and guard your wrist and escort you back tomorrow, just to be sure of it. He added after a moment. We will, however, be keeping the horses. He is to be released? The soaring thrill his words engendered died in her chest. That Adelis was innocent, or be frank, something like innocent, she had no doubt. But he might mean only that her brother was slated to be summarily executed, yet have, as a pious mercy, his body returned to his family, such as she was, for burial, instead of being hung on a gibbet outside the city gates as a lesson to other would-be traitors. Whatever the answer, the captain already knew. And the pity in his face frightened her far more than the sternness. He didn't reply, but just surrounded her with his men and marched her out into the winding streets of Patos. So they'd both been right, she and Adelis. Her pathetic escape scheme was doomed to failure. 
and his remaining in his captivity was a horrible, horrible mistake. And I think I will stop there. If this was unpublished, I would ask the room if they wanted me to keep on, but I can't see you and you can uh, actually buy this yourself, so. <laughs> That was wonderful. Uh, very very strange not to have the feedback from the audience while I'm reading. And sorry, I'm looking away at the screen at the comment sections too. So even your audience of one isn't all that strong either. <coughs> but uh, Lois, of course, was reading from Penwick's Travels. One of the advantages of this format that we're using in is that I can actually show you. Oops, I'm sorry for preempting you, but. Uh -huh. Oh, um, that's even better. Well, you can't see it, Lois. Um, they're getting a full screen view of. Oh, I see the slide travels. in the background. You're off in the corner. Yep. And I am. And, yeah. and it's the beautiful artwork by Dan Dos Santos. This, of course, is the brand new hardcover that just came out this month. It's currently available at your, well, at those retail stores that are open. Um, and it is available for ordering online as well at your favorite e retailer. The previous work, which uh, Lois had also mentioned, is Penrich Progress. Um, again, we get a chance to really show off that artwork on its own before, of course, showing you as well what the final book looks like. And one of the beautiful things about this is these are these individual novellas that Lois has been putting out on her own as ebook only and also getting done as audiobooks. Uh, but these are Omnibuy editions gathering together the novellas, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they're gathering together the novellas in um, chronological form of internal chronology of the story, correct? Correct, yeah. I did not actually write them in order, which is the thing I do, uh, <laughs> to the immense confusion of everyone. Yeah. But uh, we we are complaining. We, we love bopping around now. on the Picasso verse as well. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, we're going to get to some of you, you guys' questions. There's been lovely comments in the comment section as well. But we're going to go ahead and start at the top with Joseph Wagner, who was wondering, um, where do Penrick stories occur relative to the Chalian stories? And I guess when might also be irrelevant. All right, when and where. Uh, it falls in between The Hallowed Hunt, which is chronologically the first story, uh, novel, and uh, Curse of Chalian and Paladin of Souls actually fall after. It's about midway between. Uh, if you, if the Hallowed Hunt were taking place about 1200 our time and uh, and the uh, the Curse of Chalian and Paladin of Souls were taking place in the late 1400s. Uh, this would be 1300-ish. Uh, so it's like 100 years either way. So, uh, so he's in between. Uh, the first story starts out in the cantons, which is kind of Chalene is Switzerland. It's, it's an in-between kind of country where Penrick was born and grew up. And actually the first two stories, uh, Penrick's Demon, where he first encounters Desdemona and his life has changed, and uh, Penrick and the Shaman, where we first see him as a young temple sorcerer and divine, um, also take place in the cantons. Uh, and the uh, third story in, in Penrick's progress, uh, Hendrick's Fox takes place in the Weald, which is the country just to the south of the cantons. He has a kind of a, a visit uh, to a state occasion in the train of the Princess Archdivine. And then the uh, action moves north for this uh, over the mountains and uh, into what would be Sidonia. Sidonia is kind of world of five gods world Greece-ish uh, with all the changes that I've made, uh, which I do freely. The real world is only a, a jumping off point for me. I'm not trying to write historical fiction. Um, Jolie Lachance was wondering, is there any big Chalian novels in the manner of Curse of Chalian in the works and or will you be revisiting Ista and her family? Not at this time. Um, the, uh, I just finished the eighth Penrick and Desert and out. Does the eh, Penrick and Desdemona novella this month, uh, at the beginning of this month, and it just came out. Uh, the Physicians of Vilnock is, is the title, and we can talk about that later. Um, so I've been I've been working. It's forty two thousand words, um, but uh, but I don't have any novels in the work. I'm due for a summer off. I want to kick back and be semi retired for a while and catch up on my slacking. I'm very behind on my slacking. So. 
that is my plan for the summer. And come fall, we'll see what you know what has developed in the back of my head. Once yeah. to get out. Um, we have a question from Stephanie Songer about the necklace. She loves the necklace and is wondering where did you get it. I had this made. It is not sold in any store. Uh, I don't know where you can see it in the camera, but that is my uh, all my Hugo and Nebula and other award tie tacks. I had accumulated a box of these, and yeah, you know, what to do when you go to things like Nebula or Worldcon, and it's appropriate to wear one or two, but what do you do with eight or fourteen or seventeen of them? Um, and I was afraid of losing them. I actually did lose a nebula pin on it. It was pinned properly like a lapel pin to a shirt that I left in a restaurant jacket. Um, so uh, so I, wanted, I wanted something that would contain some, something that would display them, something that would keep them from getting lost. And I had a, have a friend here in Minneapolis, Elise Matheson, who is an art jeweler. So I took this box of tie tacks to Elise and said, Elise, do something with this. I was thinking charm bracelet, you know, something like that. But she had much better ideas. So this is a wire work, silver wire work and all kinds of other little things. There's a little uh, hematite star things on it and, uh, and whatnot. She put it all together. We sort of consulted. And, Would you like this to be discreet or in your face? I said, in your face. And that's what we got. So that is the story of the, uh, the Hugo Nebula. And indeed, Karen Kinnearnan in the comment section it con said that it was an Elise Matheson work. And I know I said we're going to give away three ebooks, but Karen, for getting that question right, I'm going to sneak a fourth one in there. Congratulations to our winners. More questions coming, though, don't worry. Um, Celine Turner was wondering Have you ever read any works by authors who have cited you as an influence? And then could you see how your influence was in their works? Um, I'm starting to see that more and more from uh, you know, younger writers and it's sort of startling. I, I didn't expect to be an influence. I don't expect to be an influence. Um, I think it is, you know, for the professionally published writers, it's very oblique. It's kind of the way you have influences. You, it's not that you want to write an imitation of Lois Bujold. You want to write a story that makes you feel the way, the way her stories made you feel. Um, it's, uh, Kind of the way inspiration works. So, uh, so now I haven't, you know, I haven't directly been told that, you know, such and such is an influence. I wouldn't recognize it otherwise. But, uh, but yeah, I'm flattered by the number of writers who read my work. You know, see, uh, see reviews occasionally online when they talk about them. So it's all good. Uh, we have. Belroar, Aurora, or Aurora, I'm not exactly sure of pronunciation, I apologize, Bell. Um, have you considered writing a novella about an adventure of the Cadelka's All Blonde Commando team? Oh, team. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's wide open. I can write anything, but I can't write everything. Uh, I can only go with, uh, first of all, what I have the time and energy for and attention, and also what speaks to me what resonates you know, psychologically with me, you know, a story that needs to be told by me. Um, so, uh, so no, that one is also not being considered at this time. Well, one person actually put in a comment how that would make a great anthology, but that also leads me to what you were saying, how the stories you need to tell, um, mm -hmm. not to put you on the spot, but there's been a number of anthologies in recent years from Bain of other authors playing in your in authors universes whether it's the freehold universe or the monster hunter universe or of course david weber's been doing it for years in the honor universe mm -hmm. just gonna put that seed out there that if you're yeah. an author you author you are, hey, you are far from the first person to you know suggest that idea <laughs> um it is contrary to the way i do my world building uh, because I don't make up my world until the story enters the stage. You know, the chair isn't there until somebody needs to sit down. Right. Uh, and so the story, the world genuinely does not exist until the story has passed through and created a, around itself, uh, which makes it a very unshareable sort of world. Uh, and I think writing her as editor on all that stuff would make me crazy. I, I tried editing and it's just not a congenial task for me. <laughs> Congratulations for doing it, Jim. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. 
Yeah, uh, <laughs> don't have to. Larry Korea was a lot more appreciative of the work we do after having to edit John Ringo. Well. Yeah, I had, to, <laughs> I had edited an anthology for Tor called Women at War in the '90s, back in the 90s. I remember that one. I was there yeah. at Tor, yeah. and it was uh, it was very enlightening to have done. I appreciated what editors did far better. You know, now that I understood it from their from their yeah. side. When you start out as a newbie writer, you just have no clue about you know, how publishing editors and all this stuff work to learn. Uh, Bell also has the classic. Is there a character of yours you particularly identify with? Not especially. I mean, all of them. Uh, yeah. And in order to write them, I have to get, you know, get into their heads to a certain degree. Even if they're not a viewpoint character, I have to have some sense of their interiority in order, in order to know what they will say when they open their mouths, uh, because they're not just uh, they're not just speaking lines to a to a script. They they generate what they have to say and do. Uh, so you know, even the villains, you know, I have to think my way into them to a degree to get to get some sense of them. So yeah, all of them. Um. Oh, another another one that uh, authors always love to hear. Uh, Don Smoker was wondering, do you have a favorite of all the books that you've written? Uh, I get that one a lot. I don't know why people expect us to know. <laughs> it's it's a frequently asked question, and I don't really have an answer. You know, whatever I'm working on at the moment, I generally have a sort of love hate relationship with. Uh, you know, it is, it is, I love it. I'm engaged with it. I'm you know, up to my eyebrows in it and God in the middle, I wonder if I'm ever going to escape. Um, so there's that. Uh, and then there's the great uh, typo hunt and editing comb out afterwards in which you're really sick of it and you can't see it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the copy edit. And then yeah, the I don't, I don't think there is, uh, there is a favorite. Yeah, each one as it passes through the year, you know, becomes my favorite for a while in order for me to work on it. And then it it's carried off in time. And uh, if it were not for, you know, proofreading all the reprints, you know, some of these books would have faded in my brain, but I get reminded of them periodically. Um, Annalise Stryer, Annalisa Stryer said that uh, she adores Penrick, but she's got a question for, uh, for Cosivers. She and her husband, I'm assuming husband Michael, would love to know why are all the delightfully creepy genetically engineered feline creatures uh, between the kitten tree and the sphinx, we're starting to worry about any cat-like critters other than Zap. <laughs> well, I actually like cats. <laughs> sort of why they why they turn up and they sort of float to the top of my mind. Uh, readers like cats for the most part, except those who are allergic and then cats like them. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so I, I don't think there's any particular explanation. Except that cats have been part of my world. Horses have been part of my world. Dogs less. When I was a kid, we had a dog. Um, so, uh, insect. Yes, interestingly enough, uh, my uh, uh, biology advisor back in college raised cockroaches in his lab. He was an insect toxicologist. So I visited him once and took pictures. Um, but, uh, nobody, nobody was worrying about saving his experimental animals. Working <laughs> 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 on the right thing there. Yeah, I, yeah, I grew up in a farming family, so uh, yeah, we weren't quite so precious about animals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Don Smoker also was wondering, will we get more about Tanner and Adelis, and of course Basha? Ah, yes. Uh, Basha is a, one of those characters that almost ran away with the story. He appears in the, uh, actually the third novella in Penrick's Travels, the Prisoner of Limnos is where he pops up. He's supposed to be a subsidiary character and then he just, you know. Keeps shoving his way in, huh? It was so interesting, but he's, you know, all his really dramatic stuff is backstory for him, you know, events that have already taken place. And I'm not sure how much you know, energy there would be writing him, you know, if I already know how it comes out, it would be like writing a prequel. Um, and he's now about 40 in, at the time of that of the story where he's introduced. And uh, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, 
his story going forward is bound up with Tanner and Adelis and a whole bunch of things that I haven't decided what I want to do with yet. He also has the option of you know, being detached from them and you know, going on some kind of separate adventure uh, with or without Penrick. Uh, there, there are some possibilities there. Just, just getting the two of them together so they can clash off each other because they, well, they get along well, but they, they, they spark. <laughs> There's some friction there. So that can yeah. be a lot of fun. Uh, to do that with you know the characters who are you know, for whatever reason have to work with each other uh, and aren't too crazy about it. It, it is a classic motif, no doubt. Oh, Susan yes. Digard Diola, again apologies on the pronunciations, but Susan Digard Diola uh, was wondering. Um, she loves the interaction between Penric and the Princess Arc Divine. Uh, is there any chance you'll ever go back and write some earlier Penric stories when she was still alive? That is actually you know, one of the possibilities kicking around. I would like to do at least one or more novella in Penrick's 20s before I get too far away from them. Uh, and he you know, becomes too distant as a character and becomes, um, if you write prequels, it's a little tricky. You have to figure out why this story was never thought of in things that happen later in the timeline but you know earlier in the writing um and you know why it doesn't have you know more of an impact if it's important enough to write a story about at all uh so it, it can be done um but uh but if i'm going to do it i should probably do it sooner rather than later you know, as i develop these characters in this world um denise could take oops said, that was an interesting relationship between penrick and, and his mentor uh, Arch Divine. That's always a very formative and important one. Um, uh, Teresa Scott was wondering, will the Father of Winter be featured in one of the stories? My original plan for the Chalian books, back when they were the Chalian books, um, was that it was going to be a closed thematic series with one book for each of the five gods. And I got the first three done. And the daughter of Spring was Kazril's book, and the bastard was Ista's book, and uh, the brother of Autumn was Ingri's book, Ingri and Ajada. But then I sort of wasn't all that interested in the other two gods. <laughs> and then I went off and wrote the Sharing Knife books, uh, which uh, took things in a completely different direction for a while. Uh, so I don't think I'm going to get back to that pattern. You know, how I started, one of the thoughts in my mind when I started Penrick was that if this idea of the pattern of, of the five book thematic series was preventing me from writing more in the world of Chalium, it wasn't a good thing anymore and I needed to throw it out, you know, one, right. any other expectations, which I did and that's how you got Penrick. It is a thing that people only know to ask for more of what they like that they've already seen. Nobody knows how to ask for the thing they've never seen. Yet. Nobody before I wrote him would have asked for more Penrick. Yeah, and now they are. So it's, it's yeah. my job to surprise you, despite yourselves. And you're doing a fine job for a long time. Um, I'm going to paraphrase a little, but Denise Couture said that she'd been at a science fiction convention and had her picture taken with a person in a Miles character costume that was uh, quite well done. Uh, what's your take on the whole cosplaying when it happens in your universe and you spot it? I'm fine, you know, this isn't something I'm competing with since I cannot sew. Um, go have fun, that's good fan activity. You know, there's some very impressive costumers out there. They've done some amazing things. There were some group Dendary things done a number of years ago that they showed off at a convention. So it's a lot of fun, go for it. Um, Chris Fleming was wondering if you've thought about narrating your own audio books yourself. I could possibly do it, but I would rather not. Uh, Blackstone has been doing a fine job. You know, we license them the rights and they take it away and do all the work, uh, which is great. Less work for Lois. Um, that, uh, that works for me. And they have leave it to professionals is my take too. I handle yeah. a lot of our licensing for audiobooks and I'm happy to let them take over that and let them do uh -huh. what they know best. 
Yeah, it, leave it, it to the it, professional. Especially, it requires you know technical expertise. Uh, more fans, of course, of Basha coming through. What now? I said more, more, more love for Basha and Tanner and Adelis. Mm. Re yeah. Revisiting some questions here. Uh, uh, there we go. Um, so uh, Catherine Aragon couldn't help but notice how in the Fracasivers, the first four books each have a different protagonist. Any idea how Miles became the main character of that universe? Well, Miles has a way of taking over. <laughs> I think it's just natural to Miles. Um, yeah, the, uh, he was actually, he actually got his start in the second book. Uh, it was the second book I ever wrote. The first one was Shards of Honor, which was my first novel and the first one published. So it's, you know, however you start, it's first. And that was Cordelia's book. Uh, and then I sort of jumped forward 17 years to Miles. Uh, at this point, I had not yet sold anything. I was still back in Marion, Ohio, and you know, writing my first three books in isolation. Uh, and sending them off to New York and getting rejections uh, very, very, very slowly, the way, the way that you do. Um, and so the third book I wrote was Ethan of Athos, because at that time I was thinking, you know, this might not be a series, something I can do as a series. This should be something that stands alone as a separate science fiction novel, that's proper science fiction. Um, and, uh, and then the fourth one was, of course, Falling Free, uh, which was the first book I wrote on contract you know, after I had sold it to Bain, uh, was after I sold the first three books to Bain in the fall of 1985. Uh, and that was, you know, I had to kind of get over the alarm of you know, writing for someone uh, rather than you know, in, in the vacuum, which I had gotten used to. Uh, so what's when the fifth one was Brothers in Arms. So I kind of came back to Miles and it was just, you know, it was an idea I had, I wanted to do. Uh, and started him off in his story, uh, back with the Dendary. Actually, the board game followed, so the board game is a prequel as well. Because uh, I didn't write that until after. I think the Borders of Infinity collection was in there somewhere, and then uh, and then the board game, um, and then uh, and then after that, they became more chronological. For the most part, although Cedaganda was a jump back. So yeah, anything can happen. Um, we've got a comment from Jill Vasilakas Long. I've always thought that one of the great jokes of the Verkazigan stories is that everyone attributes Miles' strategic ability to his father, when to me his strategies look much more like his mother. I suspect yeah. our Errol got the joke. Is there any chance of a story that sees that? I think that is just going to be one of those embedded things that people will either realize or they don't. Uh, although it's pointed up a few times. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, about it. it's pretty obvious to those yeah. who read the books, but it is yeah. a great point, though. I think, I think you know, in, in his early years, he was more focused on his dad, you know. It's only as he became older, became a parent to himself, that he really began to grow more conscious of all that his mother had done, uh, which is something that happens when you become a parent. Uh, so, so I think the reader's awareness sort of follows from Miles because you're being filtered through his viewpoint and you tend not to see the things he doesn't see. Um, Bell Roar wonders, uh, you have such great romance in your novels, I'm paraphrasing a little. Uh, is that something you really deliberately choose to set out to do or just ends up unfolding from the characters on its own? Both from the characters. It's something that I think is a, is a basic human motivation. If you want to get characters in motion, you've got to give them something to be you know, struggling to achieve. Uh, it, is, it is the world's most basic biological reward. Um, so, uh, so, no, I think it, it arises naturally. Not every book has a romance in it. Uh, some don't. Uh, so, uh, I think, yeah, it just, it comes from the particular characters. If, if they are of a time in their life when that is a thing, it will be a thing in the story. Now, the Sharing Knife Tetralogy was actually a deliberate attempt to exactly balance romance and fantasy uh, in, in the plot, in the world building, and there's all kinds of structural things going on with that, uh, with those two. 
And it was interesting in that some people don't like their peas touching their mashed potatoes. You know, the, uh, the romance readers wanted more romance and uh, action fantasy readers wanted less romance and more action. Yeah, I think it was all there in the end, if you read far enough. Uh, so and that was, uh, that was- And in the end, the right answer is the human condition. Yeah, I think well, that would cover it. Yeah, it's- uh, um, uh, we, uh, if you've got time for a few more questions that yeah, we're running a little bit over, but um, uh, there's a really good one here. Uh, is there any new proto characters that you're currently in love with that you're cooking up for us? Anything percolating in the back, even if you're taking the break? Anything yeah. you think is going to be? Um, I'm, I haven't had the break yet. <laughs> yeah. Something, yeah. I get, yeah, after a while, not at the moment, after a while, I get bored if I don't have anything to work on. Yeah, I want to write something. I'm going to be working on something. Uh, so something will come. But yeah, it's not going to be as fast as it was in the days when I was running as fast as I could to meet the bills. Uh, they will come. They will come when they're ready. And I'm not going to trying to be pulling stories like a badger out of its hole anymore. I will just let them appear and present themselves. Uh, okay, I will write you because clearly you're ready to go. Yeah. Uh, Mel Todd asks a question. I'm sure a lot of people are thinking. Uh, I love Red Queen. Any more Jolie and Cordelia? Ah, Jolie and Cordelia. Uh, it's the same answer as everything. You know, I'm not, nothing is being worked on in that direction at this time. Uh, because nothing is being worked on at this time. I've got Nebula Weekend coming up. That's kind of looming large in my frame at the moment. I'll get the other side of that. We'll, we'll catch up and on I the think Slack. I'm anyway. just going to go ahead and wrap up. Rather than put it as a question, I'll put it as a phrase. Uh, sorry, you were lagging. Go ahead to finish your comment if you need more time. Go ahead. All right, good. That, sorry. A little bit of a warp. We're getting close to the end here. Um, Bellaroar, we had a question, but it's really more a comment complimenting you on the forward thinking about pronoun awareness with Belforn decades before it came into social consciousness at large. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're going to go ahead and just say thank you so much for taking the time to read this. I'm going to go ahead and share out one more time the lovely book that just came out from Bain, collection of Fenric's Adventures, Fenric's Travels, now available in bookstores near you. Here's a look at what the cover looks like with that beautiful Dan Dos Santos art. Yeah, it's really good art. Uh, I love, I love what Dan's been doing. And of course, if you wonder if you want to get all the stories in the chronological order, Henrik's progress is where to begin. And there's even more coming with original novellas. Uh, any projection on when that eighth one's going to be coming out, Lois? Which one? The eighth one that you're just finishing oh. up is there projected? The eighth one is out now. It's oh, out it just came book. out. I didn't yeah. realize that. The Physicians of Vilnock, I have blog posted all about it. If, uh, if people want to find my blog on Goodreads, uh, if you search Lois McBaster Bujold Goodreads blog, it should come up. Um, and that's where I put all my publishing news. So if you want to keep up with Bujold, you know, anything that's happening, I will put on the blog. And if nothing is happening, there will be long stretches between posts. <laughs> right at the moment, there have been a lot of posts because there's been a lot of publicity and other things going on recently. Well, from all of us, let me just say congratulations and well-deserved on the Grandmaster. And Thank thanks you. again for joining us. Thank you. This has been fascinating. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.